Well, thanks, folks. And we're back with our first panel, or we're here with our first panel for the Law and Mental Health Conference. Got some great speakers. Let's go around the room and each of us introduce ourselves so we'll get a chance to hear who is in the panel, who has been giving us the uh, presenting today. And let's start with uh, Victoria. Victoria is sitting in for Representative Adam Smith. Hi, my name is Victoria Bautista. I work for Representative Adam Smith as a senior legislative assistant on health care and judiciary policy. I've been working on his legislation related to the crisis care continuum, including the Community Crisis Responders Act, uh, which is a bill that would provide a, feder a stable federal funding stream for mobile unarmed crisis response teams, as well as the Behavioral Health Crisis Care Centers Act, uh, which would provide funding for crisis stabilization. Um, I've been working on healthcare and judiciary policy for the last uh, four and a half years now, and so very excited to be here. Great to have you. Thanks for coming. Uh, uh, Jackson. Sure. Yeah, my name is Jackson Beck, and I'm with the Beer Institute of Justice, specifically Vera's Redefining Public Safety Initiative. And I've been at Vera for about five years, and really that whole time have focused on improving responses for people experiencing behavioral health crises. Um, have have done a good amount of qualitative research around what local programs are doing to gradually reduce police involvement in crisis situations. And more recently have shifted to using that research to apply some of the lessons we've learned and work with local government staff and with advocates to drive change in their communities and, and try to stand up the same kinds of approaches. Thanks, Jackson. Uh, and let's jump over to Jason. Hey everyone, um, great to be here. My name is Jason Tanda Bibiana. I work with Jackson at the Barry Institute of Justice with our Redefining Public Safety Initiative. Um, I'm a researcher, so along with Jackson and other uh, colleagues, um, a lot of our work has been learning from local programs, um, advocates, and folks doing this work to stand up um, alternative or civilian crisis response programs. Um, so that's the innovative focus of work. I'm excited to have the opportunity to share with you all today. And thanks, guys. Thanks for representing Vera here for the second year in a row. It's really great information you bring every time. Uh, Isabel. Hi, everyone. Really happy to be here. My name is Dr. Isabel Lancer. Um, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, and I currently work at UCLA as a social justice policy analyst. Um, I got my work or my start with mobile crisis response um, while I was in grad school and was a part of sort of the initial development of a mobile crisis team on UCLA's campus. Um, and I spent a lot of time uh, during my training also working with the College Counseling Center at UCLA. Thanks, Isabel. Congratulations. Uh, Steve. Hi, Steve Michio. I'm the CEO of People USA. We're a peer run organization here in New York serving uh, eight counties and providing a lot of crisis, uh, mobile crisis services, crisis stabilization, and uh, respite houses here in New York. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Courtney. Hi, everyone. My name is Courtney Tassian. I'm an LPC out in Colorado, and I'm currently the crisis intervention program manager for the city of Aurora, where I oversee a law enforcement model co-responder team, an alternative response team with EMTs and targeted violence prevention program. Thanks, Courtney. Dr. Waltz. Uh, hi, I'm Mitzi Waltz. Um, I'm an autism researcher and I coordinate a global health program in Amsterdam, where as you can tell, it's almost midnight. Thank you. Uh, Felicia, are you there? Hi. It's such a great presentation. We just finished watching your presentation, so it's great to have you here. Thank you. I am Felicia Spratt. I am the 911 Diversion Clinical Director at Behavior Health Response. I oversee our crisis response unit, our 911 call diversion, and our soon-to-be um, non-police response um, team. Oh, fantastic. What a great panel. This, we've got a huge amount of knowledge here. So we can take, we're going to run for about 60 minutes or until the gas runs out. Uh, we can take questions from the uh, viewers if they type the question in the chat. 
Um, but it may be also that members of this panel have some questions to ask each other uh, coming from the presentations that we saw today. Just such an amazing amount of information. Does anybody have a question they'd like to go first? If not, I'll jump in. I wanna talk about workforce and training and, and come back to, um, to the, some of the members earlier in the uh, panel. Uh, Victoria, you, we heard from Representative Smith earlier today talk about training that's available for um, uh, outreach workers. But Dr. Waltz has just told us that we might need a whole different skill set. Uh, to uh, connect with people who are neurodivergent. Is there anything in the pipeline that provides training for, for uh, outreach teams around neurodivergency? I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of like defining what that training looks like at this point. So I guess short answer up front, no. Uh, there is no current program that would encapsulate the kind of training that needs to be done for outreach workers um, to encapsulate how to interact with, with people who are neurodivergent um, in a crisis situation. That being said, I know that there is currently legislation, uh, legislation that we're going to be introducing in the coming uh, months related to um, increasing uh, reporting and research into how all emergency responders interact with people with disabilities, um, mental and, and intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as physical disabilities. Um, that's a bill out of the Senate side with uh, Senator Casey. It's called the Dialed Act. I think it's a really great first step. Um, but in terms of like what we have right now, I think there's a lot of, of work to be done. Courtney and uh, Felicia and Steve, you all actually do training for your teams. Um, Responding to Dr. Waltz's presentation around neurodivergency, what are you seeing on the streets? What are you seeing in the people that you're talking to? I can go first. Um, so we see a bunch of different things, of course. Every jurisdiction is going to be different. Every community is different. The city of Aurora is one of the most diverse communities in the nation, but within Colorado especially, we have over 150 160 different languages spoken total. So that adds a whole level of complexity to our neurodivergent population. So we see a lot of, um, you know, what's coined meltdowns. And I'm not an expert within the autism community. All of my training has come from um, Dr. Lori Sperry and then the lived experience that we work with. So apologies if I'm not on top of it with the terms. But um, we see a lot of meltdowns that result in family members or group homes requesting police due to feeling like they are not in control of the situation or that they don't have the accurate resources or understanding on how to better manage that situation. So we get called a lot for that to be um, kind of the vehicle to getting someone to the hospital on an involuntary hold, which is not our process. We typically go a very different route. We're very involuntary hold process averse. So we're seeing a lot of that. We also see a lot of eloping. So individuals who are either on the spectrum or who have other types of neurodivergency or other developmental delays who have run from their home um, or a group home. We have a very large group home population here. Steve? Yeah, I can, I can say that we also have some pretty diverse populations. We serve um, Yonkers, New York, and Westchester County, all the way up to the North Country in the Adirondacks in New York. So you can imagine the, the, the mix of folks we have. But uh, the staff are, uh, we work with the state to get the staff trained on all the teams um, in neuro neurodiversity so that they understand the better engagement process. Um, I used to also work in that field as well. So I was very familiar with how to engage differently and, and how to work with and communicate uh, more proactively with people in the community. So we provide internal training and then we get the state training as well. And it, it so far has been working very well where it's uh, you know allowed us to avoid having to get the police involved uh, in many situations. Felicia, what yes, do you see in St. Louis? So here in St. Louis, um, we actually have a 
pretty unique uh, population of individuals. Um, we do not get a lot of calls from individuals um, who are neuro um, divergent. However, what we do um, see is a lot of individuals who I believe as Courtney spoke um, earlier is um, that have issues and concerns within the family and their family members, maybe their children might, you know, um, be suffering with um, anything from ADHD to autism. Now here recently we did have a few cases of some adults who actually get on the bus or the train and got to St. Louis and the young man or young man was actually lived with autism and we actually had to get them back to Tennessee. Um, when working with those individuals, thankfully we had some police officers or a police officer who's actually working with um, one of my clinicians at the time and his son lived with autism as well. And so it was a very unique um, opportunity for him to actually be with him. And we actually stayed with that young man until his mom actually came from Tennessee back here because he actually eloped, eloped um, from his group home and he just so happened to get on the bus and stopped off in St. Louis. Now, as far as the training that we provide our um, staff as well as the officers and those within the community, um, are things such as like mental health first aid, mental health uh, first aid for um, the youth. We um, provide, um, I believe it's called first you know, trauma-informed response. I know everyone understanding here about the trauma-informed care, but it is another mechanism where it's called trauma-informed response. And how do we respond from that trauma-informed lens um, outside, just thinking outside the box of how we will respond um, typically with just the lens of being trauma-informed um, care under that model. I also realized I didn't touch on our training that we do, I apologize. So we hold a um, citywide training that brings in the person who trains the FBI's behavioral analysis unit, Dr. Lori Sperry, to do a training on kind of tips and tricks for working with those with autism or neurodivergence for first responders specifically. That training also includes like, you know, if someone with autism does go missing, check waterways, check transportation hubs, things like that. And then all of our crisis intervention team training classes, that 40 hour week does include a section on autism, which includes talking with someone with lived experience as well. So Dr. Waltz, what are you hearing here? Is this sounding like people are going in the right direction? For the most part, yeah. And I mean, there are some great resources out there for first responder training. In particular, there's a number of people who've been doing training in that area for years. I know Dennis DeBolt in the Midwest, um, and he will travel. He's retired now, has been really active. He's a former police officer and uh, has worked with ambulance techs and all kinds of people. He'd be a great guy to reach out to. One thing that does sometimes feel concerning is we forget that group homes sometimes are not the places people want to be. And when you or I don't want to live where we live, we can get up and go. We can get on a bus, but someone who's in a group home can be treated as an absconder or an escapee as if it's a prison. And um, they can be kind of carceral spaces at times. And if you see that a particular facility has a lot of people trying to get away from it quite often. Sometimes there's something going on there that you need to know about. We've certainly had that happen in the UK. I worked in the UK for years. A couple of the places that ended up in the news, um, if someone had been looking at the number of people who tried to run, it might have been the clue that was needed to get someone out of there who was an abusive person. Um, but it's hard, you know, when people don't have words, they use behavior, right? And uh, that absconding behavior can be one of them. But I think it is important just to develop your communication skills, which is a thing that you can do without having to bring in consultants and do anything fancy. Just think, what are all the ways I could communicate with somebody? Could I draw pictures? Could I write? You can download PEC symbols from the internet and use them for free. Can you show someone something on your phone? You know, how can you do it? When someone's in crisis, having lots and lots of tools to communicate is your best, your best strategy if you haven't got a specialist person on, on your team. I have a question from the chat and it's for Victoria. And the question is, um, are there discussions in Congress that have focused on addressing rural and remote area specific challenges? doing a 
outreach team, they all seem to be designed for big cities. Yeah, um, I I definitely think that there is a lack of robust discussion around rural areas when it comes to crisis response. That being said, I think that there are a lot of really great programs um, that do exist for rural crisis response. Um, for example, so before I worked for Congressman Smith, I was working for a member out of Oklahoma. Uh, and in Oklahoma, the one of the um, CCBHCs, Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers out there, uh, had a co-op agreement with local emergency responders uh, to bring iPads with them. So if they met somebody in a crisis, they could just, you know, FaceTime somebody from the CCBHC, um, have that conversation, have that de-escalation, de-escalation, de sorry, um, and potentially connect them to care. Uh, that's not necessarily a model that like I, I get to interact with a lot right now because I work for uh, Washington's Ninth, which is majority urban population, mostly South Seattle uh, and South King County. Um, but the the options are out there. People have been working on crisis response for, for decades now. And so I think um, in rural areas, while there is some uh, work that needs to be done in funding a lot of those programs, um, I think that they the examples exist um, to show it's very possible. Now, uh, continuing with Victoria, there's a, or if anybody has any comment about what Victoria's just said, why don't we chime in now? Hey, Jason, Victoria, yeah. I was gonna, oh. Go ahead. Um, I was gonna share a few ideas and I'll, I'll try and um, find the links so you can put them in the chat for folks. Um, one, just the example that you shared, Victoria, definitely um, sounds familiar of rural and remote places. Um, sort of relying on different strategies, including telehealth um, or like partnerships with like a, a, a mental health provider that maybe has a, a bit more of a regional approach. And often like if it is, um, police are the ones who are first responding, figuring out ways to sort of have, have them have supports or um, build out sort of the mental health and community-based um, services. There's a there's a great report maybe that is a few years old, I'll try and find it, but it was, it was um, learning from rural and remote law enforcement agencies around their strategies, which included um, some, some of these telehealth approaches, but often also trying to rely on their uh, mental health partners. Um, I think the other, this is a, a definitely a question that we're trying to keep track of at the Beer Institute as well, is, is a lot of the newer civilian crisis response models are in, in cities that have a bit more resources. Um, but one thing I'll say is there are, you know, a handful of places that are trying to do countywide or state level implementation. Um, I think it takes a little bit more, maybe more challenging to, to get that uh, implementation at scale, but there's a few there's a few counties. And I guess maybe a question I had, so one of the cities that um, the, the Beer Institute works in where we have a, a satellite office is New Orleans. So we're working on local program implementation there, but we're also trying to keep track of the state level policy. And um, the Louisiana Department of Behavioral Health, um, maybe the past two years or so is um, really like trying to access funding through Medicaid to, to strengthen their statewide behavioral health crisis system, not just crisis response, but also like crisis receiving um, and those sorts of things. So I think it, you know, that's just one example of the state level approach. I do think, you know, it, it is limited in that focus first on Medicaid, but I'm, I'm curious if, you know, at the federal policy level, if you have any lessons learned for us or insights on how to like get the, the national down to uh, state and then local level, so. Yeah, no, um, I, I think right now it's it's sort of uh, a, a race for creativity. So the way that we've supported um, our local crisis response team um, most directly is through community project funding or congressionally directed spending, or what's really known as earmarks, right? They're ways that members of Congress can bring light to local projects um, and federal funding without having to go through what is kind of an arduous process of trying to get federal funding. And so um, we managed to get $775,000 to Health One, the local community crisis response unit, uh, and expand their capacity pretty significantly um, in FY22, so last year. Um, other than that, uh, ARPA's, the American Rescue Plan's um, version of the CAHOOTS Act should be kicking in April 2024. So what that's going to look like is um, states will now 
states, if they apply for it, will now be able to access enhanced Medicaid funding. I, th I believe it's like an 85% FMAP um, if they have what is known as qualified community-based uh, crisis response teams. Um, CMS is currently coming up with a lot of like what that means and what the qualifications are. Uh, but I know that they have distributed 20 planning grants to 20 different states across the country uh, to, to get a lot of those systems started up. And uh, more rounds of funding should be coming up uh, as time goes on. Um, of, I, I read a report recently that I, I'd be happy to share, um, I believe from the Kaiser Family Foundation, that did a survey of behavioral health crisis um, services coverage for insurance. And of the 45 states that were surveyed, 33 of them do cover mobile crisis response. It's really like about expanding that Medicaid coverage um, through either 1115 waivers, um, through uh, pilot programs under CMS beyond 1115 waivers, um, and a couple of other methods. But um, I, I think right now Medicaid is starting to catch up. Uh, my sincere hope is that private insurance and Medicare can can soon do the same thing. Hello. And then, oh, sorry, one other thing. Um, HHS also uh, has been providing uh, grants through their community responders program um, that is not a currently authorized program, but does, has put up a notice of funding opportunity, a NOFO, uh, over the last couple of years for crisis response teams to get funding uh, from HHS, um, basically to help with like a lot of startup costs and training. Um, we're hoping to get that funded again this year. It might be a little bit of an uphill battle since uh, uh, there have been some fights on Congress on, on Capitol Hill lately to to cut HHS's budget. But um, my boss, Rep. Smith, uh, as well as Congresswoman uh, Cory Bush, Congresswoman Katie Porter, and Congressman Tony Cardenas are working on leading an effort uh, to uh, make that funding more sustainable. So that's about ten to twenty million dollars in grants every year. That's it. Response to Victoria, anyone? I'll ask the group, I'm a little worried about Medicaid now becoming the sole funding source uh, for outreach teams, uh, moving, shifting away from general funds. Um, and this is gonna have sort of federal, and this I'm paraphrasing a question from the chat, sort of a federal template for what is and what isn't um, acceptable. Uh, and you know, that everybody has to have a diagnosis and be in this different continuum. Um, any thoughts about how this is going to shape alternative mobile response, this shift to Medicaid? I, I think we should be terrified um, because it can change at, at any moment. But I do think the state's should accept the responsibility of backing it up should there be any federal issues that the state will then come in and do the right thing for the mobile teams and you know going forward uh but there's no guarantee you know it, it always depends on the the unfortunate politics of our world um but I, I think it is something we should be advocating now to ensure that we can uh sustain our teams, you know, at the levels that we're that we're operating at. Other comments or thoughts about med shift to Medicaid? I'm just going to kind of say something similar. I think Medicaid can be great to offset costs, but relying on it solely, I agree, could be quite dangerous for a lot of reasons. I mean, you mentioned diagnosis. It really gets rid of the trauma informed approach of crisis is self defined. Crisis means something to very different people. And we're also looking at how that excludes and stigmatizes this very particular group of people who getting diagnosed can mean life-changing effects, like people who are first responders, people who are in the military, that by having these interactions and getting a diagnosis could actually create adverse effects in their daily life and their quality of life. So I personally, uh, again, I could see it being beneficial for offsetting, but to rely on it solely, um, I agree, could be quite dangerous. Yeah, I and think- I worry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, I think the issue of diagnosis is really interesting because 
you know, just because someone's in crisis doesn't necessarily mean they meet any diagnostic criteria and wondering, you know, what happens to it? Can we respond in those situations when there's not a clear diagnosis? I know as a clinician, it's already hard enough to get, you know, insurance reimbursements for people that I see. And I can only imagine having to, you know, get, um, like paid for service to people who just clearly don't meet diagnostic criteria would be such a challenge and another barrier. Well, Isabel, don't, do you think that this would, you know, eventually, maybe not initially, but eventually shape a campus-based team to look through that prism, that lens of diagnosis instead of just seeing people for what they, you know, what's going on at the moment? Yeah, I I mean, I think one of the unique or interesting things about campus mental health is, uh, or campus responding to crises on campus is the integration with campus mental health services. Because um, in the event that a student is in crisis and they're um, like a patient of the campus mental health service and it's an emergency situation, they can integrate care with like their clinician if they're already part of that team. So I think that would be one avenue that diagnosis plays a role. Um, But I think it really sort of depends, I guess, on how the universities ultimately define crisis as I think was just mentioned too, of, you know, our crises on campus can range from a student who's having a lot of trouble just sort of regulating their emotions in the moment they get a bad test score and, you know, something is just, they're feeling really activated all the way to, you know, suicidal or homicidal intent. Um, so it's a really big range that we're responding to. Um, and yeah, I think have, having to have a diagnosis would really kind of limit the range of what a team would be able to respond to on campus and open students up to maybe feeling like they're not as protected, I think, as was mentioned, if they do interact with our teams. So maybe one of the areas of technical support that's necessary is this bridging these relationships between the federal government, the state government, the local government, which is actually the funding mechanism, to the agencies or individuals that are doing this service on the street. Quite complicated. I was going to jump in and say something about um, my main concern when it ends up in the health corner is that we forget that so many of the solutions that are needed are not health solutions. A lot of people today have been talking about housing first approaches and trauma informed approaches and thinking of the whole person. But when you're going down that healthcare track, it all becomes about what's wrong with the person and how do we fix them, which is often not very effective, even if it uh, was true, which it isn't. I totally agree with um, Dr. Walls because I know here in St. Louis, our funding is actually um, through our city and it's through the ARPA funds. And no one we engage with has to have a diagnosis. We don't even know if they have one or don't have one until we maybe look them up in the system and see if they're already connected with the behavioral health provider. And within those instances, um, we just reconnect them with with their uh, mental health provider and we actually keep the ones um, who do not have a mental health provider and does not have a diagnosis and we continue to provide them with the necessary services. With that being said, a lot of those individuals are, we have to look at it from a holistic, point of view. Um, case in point, we had a, a 14 year old, she called the police. I mean, every single day, three, four, five times a day. Um, this is when we first started. And this young lady, um, she was being cared for by her great, great grandmother. She was in her nineties and she was 14 at the time. And I heard about it. I was just visiting the police station for whatever reason I was there doing a the meeting and they were talking about this house that was condemned. They didn't have air. It was in mid in the mid summertime. And holistically, they were looking at the young lady as being the issue and the problem. But the problem really was because she was hot and because she they didn't have food um, and she was too embarrassed to say that. 
and it was being covered up. But by the time my, myself and my team, or I sent my team over there, we, we ended up bringing the community together. We bought them air conditioners. We got their entire front porch fits. Uh, and now she's thriving. She's getting an award in three weeks at our banquet because that young lady has graduated, is graduating high school, has a job, has not called the police. Yes, she does take meds. Um, yes, she is connected with services, but now she's been active in the community because we dealt with the very foundation of self-sufficient needs before we can ever deal with um, the mental health, the physical health or anything else. So I totally agree with you, Dr. Wallace, that sometimes we're looking at it from only a physical health and mental health aspect when the reality is, is that you cannot help anyone in, a, in that aspect if you're not dealing with the basic um, needs of life. It's impossible to do. Um, so our team really do do a lot, a lot of the wraparound services, whether or not we're funded with Medicaid or we're funded through our city, um, the federal government, local government, state government, it really doesn't matter um, where we get the funding from because everyone that we can come in contact with will um, have some type of, of support and services by any means necessary. And that's pretty much how we operate here in St. Louis because we really, really believe in saving lives um, one at a time, if all, if, if nothing at all. So thank you for that, Dr. Moss. It'd be great if people could actually prescribe housing, wouldn't it? <laughs> Other thoughts or comments on the CAHOOTS Act and the coming of the Medicaid funding? How's it going to change your agency, your approach? Can we actually be insurance blind on the street? Okay, well, we'll move on. Let's talk a little bit more about workforce and especially about training. And we, we heard quite a bit about things we ought to do from uh, as far as training from uh, Courtney and Aurora and from uh, Isabel and from Jackson, Jason and from Steve, all kinds of encouraging ideas. What do we need to be looking for in support from the feds or the states as far as training? You know, in, in every state, there's a voc rehab, um, you know, that, that supports employment, supports training and things like that. Um, they're very old school in New York and, and I, they need to be, they need to evolve uh, to include uh, people with criminal backgrounds and, and all different backgrounds, really. Um, and, you know, we've been trying to piece it together with and without them. Um, but I think there needs to be some kind of evolution around the way we think about workforce and training and, and who we, you know, who qualifies for that, those types of trainings. Just, just a little, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just a quick little poll. Does anybody have a state vocational rehabilitation system that's up to speed with the modern world? No, oh, okay. Sorry. Courtney? I was saying, so when we're talking about workforce and clinicians, there's not always a lot of upward mobility that exists in positions like this. So training and investing in your people in terms of professional development is one way to keep them interested in the role, but also to show that we, we do care and we want you here. And just because there's not necessarily a title change, we can help you add certifications. We can help you with licensure. So something that we're doing with my team, all of my licensed staff are getting their certification for approved clinical supervisor, which is kind of a license within itself here. We're sending people through a licensed addiction counselor certification so that we can invest in them and say, you know, here's this, but also it expands your knowledge to act and work more effectively on the street and serve the clients that are in our community every day. We build in quite a big training budget. Yeah, I think um, something that comes to mind just like at the state level is, you know, how do we cha train sort of all clinicians and making crisis prevention and crisis de-escalation a core part of like CE requirements and requirements for licensure. Um, as I was going through my program, I noticed that that was a huge, huge gap in our training as therapists are basically taught, like if it's imminent danger, harm to self, harm to others, just call 911 and nobody really talks about it much further. 
Um, and so I led a few crisis prevention and de-escalation trainings at various clinics that I worked with. And it was really just like eye-opening to see clinicians that have been working in the field for many years say like, oh, I've not really thought about like, what are the skills that I need to de-escalate and prevent the need to even call 911 or call campus police? Um, and so I think like that could be a change that I think would benefit the systems as a whole. Jason Jackson, let me drag you in here. Is uh... yeah, I was just going to say. Speaking of nine one one, I think like the training of nine one one operators is also an important part of this conversation. So helping call takers understand when someone they're talking to or someone who's describing um, what a family member is going through or a neighbor or someone they've encountered on the street, helping them understand what to ask to get at the root of what's going on and um, identify that we, we might be dealing with a me mental health crisis or other behavioral health crisis. And then um, helping them feel confident in tapping into whatever other resources might be available to them at that dispatch center. Of course, unfortunately, in many cases, the police are still going to be the default there. Um, but to the extent that you have um, CIT trained officers or co-response teams or ideally civilian led teams that you can dispatch because you were able to understand more of what's going on and, and flag it for them, um, then that's that's something we'd like to see more of. But um, that training for 911 operators is still like really lacking across the country and there just needs to be a lot more like concerted effort. And it's challenging too, because there are staffing shortages within 911 centers. So asking operators to take the time to sit in those trainings and learn about how they can support these responses. Um, it's it's not a light lift, but it's it's really important to make this work and divert calls from police. Jackson, I'm, I'm happy you spoke on that because currently um, at our 911 comm center, as you stated, that across the nation, you know, it's a shortage there. And I believe we're down, I believe, by 60 um, dispatchers. But currently our, our dispatchers are actually trained to be able to identify and ask questions um, at the, on that level. And if they meet a certain criteria, the caller, they actually transfer them externally to our organization and give us the opportunity to try to um, divert via phone first. But because we're expanding, now we're gonna actually have high crisis clinicians in dispatch working side by side um, with the call takers and where we can actually, I believe as I mentioned, we can answer the call directly or they can transfer the call over to us. And at that moment, our civilians, our non-police responders would be able to go out. But to speak on a training a little bit further, what a lot of people do not realize is um, the impact and the importance of training those in the community. And I know here in St. Louis, we actually, um, really highlight the training because if you see something, say something, right? I um, mean, with that being said, that a lot of the folks in the community are the ones that are actually calling 911, um, requesting help for someone who is in the crisis, who might be exhibiting some type of psychosis, um, who might be um, under the influence. And if we can train those in the community to be able to identify and become aware and recognize those signs and symptoms, then they will actually respond probably a tad bit different. Um, and by what I mean by that is that then at that moment, they can't call 911 and they can request in our community, we're called the purple shirts. And that was given by the community, right? They couldn't re remember the crisis response unit or the crew, but they definitely remember the color of our shirts. And so they would call, hey, can you send the purple shirts? 911 dispatch thought it was a joke. It was a game, you know, so they kept hanging up, kept hanging up. And so we coined that term. And so our community partners, I'm talking about the librarians, Snooks, Walgreens, um, where people actually frequently frequent that, they actually call and say, hey, can you send a purple shirt out? We have someone that might be experiencing a crisis. And then at that very moment, they know that they can either 
call us or they can try to divert them to our external, but now it's going to be our internal because we'll be there. So I think the training in that professional development goes outside of the building and it actually needs to go into the community and that community need to be aware of these folks who are there engaging with instead of calling 911, how can they be of better assistance? And it's actually working here in our community, um, especially with mental health first aid, uh, de-escalation, trauma-informed response and care. You would be surprised how many people here in the city of St. Louis are actually, uh, we're actually going out and training them so that they can respond as civilians, as the people in the community, so that they can see things that are different. And that's why I said in, in my presentation with the tagline that we are, we have one mission, we are one community, and we have one voice, and that's to save the lives of the people that we engage each and every day. So I just want to share that um, with you as well, um, Jackson, and what we are doing out here uh, with, with the training. I think that's such a great point. And when we're talking about bringing these teams into a community, especially for a community that hasn't had a community or a civilian led responder model before, we have to train the first responders on how to interact with them and how to let them do their job. Prior to our launch, we had six full months where we went to every single police briefing. We went to every single fire station. We said, here's what they are. Here's why you're going to love them. And here's what they're going to do for you. And here's how you're going to help. Because Felicia, I loved in your presentation, you talk about this is not an or, this is an and, because the reality is there will be situations where PD are needed. There's a reality that fire will be needed. And the purpose of these programs is to say, and there are moments that they're not needed. And so we're putting them in that place. So it's a lot of training of our first responder partners as well. And it took us a couple hundred years to train uh, this community how to use police and how to use fire. It's gonna take a little while. But and it's going to take a lot of effort. But we're also training Walgreens. I mean, Felicia, you just broke it down into a simple component of how they wanted to describe the the request. They wanted a purple shirt. This is listening to the community and just making use of what's already there. Yeah, that is uh, that's accurate because what happens is what has happened is um, Snooks. That's our um, store. Uh, franchise here and it's owned by the Snooks brothers and we have gone in and we have trained all of their security guards, all their managers, all of their frontline staff. The, libra the library, uh, we now have our certified peer specialist um, located at the library as a hub and when they have a crisis there, we have someone that's already there with lived experience that can help out and be of assistance. But if we're not there, they're trained of how to identify the signs and symptoms of these individuals, and they can easily just call us. They can call us through 911, or they can call us by way of my phone, or by way of some of um, my leads that work with us. And so the community is so, it's so important to make sure that the community know who you are and how you're operating. Um, and uh, like I said, I have so many testimonials and Jason was so unfair, you all. He only gave us 30 minutes. Um, and I just thought that was so unfair because we all have so much um, to talk about and to discuss. Um, but definitely that professional development piece and involving the community and giving them a voice to be involved in actually changing the community instead of just relying on our first responders, EMS, fire department, our, our co-responders um, that we have. So, and, and I, I want to say this, and I promise I am done talking, Jason. Um, the certified peer specialist, I believe we're going to have to really get a grip on that, right? And what I mean by that is that they're not just a certified peer specialist. They are very, very important to integrate them into our system of care. And what I mean by that is not just utilize them just as a lived experience, right? I'm not a certified peer specialist, but I believe they have so much to add to the integrated system and in the trajectory of individual lives that they're not, they're being underutilized and they should be utilized even more than what we're utilizing them and being able to integrate them into not just our core response model, but our non-police response model is, is going to be very, very key to the success. Why? Because they 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 look like the people in the community. They sound like the people in the community, and they can understand on the level that some of us who have just an education um, of a master's level or a doctorate or a bachelor's, where well, we are just not going to understand. They can actually sit down and get on that level with the individual, um, and I just I just see where I work at. And so I believe 
that's a whole different component of the piece of that develop that training and development and then utilization of those within the community. Because a lot of times you really do not, absolutely do not need um, someone who has an education background, but if you have a skill set and a heart for the people, I promise you it'll go a little bit further than any um, piece of paper that will ever take us, period. So I want to leave you with that, Jason. I, I would never want to stop you from speaking, Felicia. I apologize. Steve, would you would you speak a little bit about how you broke through the stigma barrier? Because we're all hearing that you have these peer teams, this peer diversion team, and it's amazing. How how did that come about? Um, for me, it just made sense. You know, the, the traditional system wasn't working well. And um, we were already uh, infusing peers into emergency rooms and clinics and all different, you know, venues. And we were seeing the value of the peer. Once, once you create clarity of what the peer's role is and you create clarity of the psychiatrist, the social worker, everybody that's on the teams, then you can start to assign, okay, here's, here's the duties. Here's our, you know, call of duty. Here's our statement of work that we need to be doing. But then we also cross-train where everyone that's willing to cross train so that we can all do kind of each other's jobs, but the peers themselves, um, they do have a different engagement and they do have a, a different skill set that they bring where they get related to sometimes in a better way and they provide better information to us that off that then we can then say, wow, what you just said was really important. Do you mind if I share that with the psychologist or psychiatrist or whatever? And we'll do it with you if you want. But that was really important what you just said, because, you know, having lived experience, you can share the mutuality of what worked, what didn't work. And, and so um, breaking the stigma was we had to demonstrate it for years, what we could do and how we could do things. And when I opened the first respite house, um, you know, the same thing is mobile teams, respite house, crisis stabilization. Nobody believed a bunch of people with lived experience were going to do, you know, a good job with anything. And then, well, you know, suddenly years later, they're seeing the, the cost savings. They're seeing the value of the service because the people that are being served aren't entering crisis services as much anymore. So we're showing the recidivism reduction. We're showing the criminal justice reduction, the quality of life on the other end of it we're showing because we're not just about crisis you know we're not none of us are we're about the quality of life of the people we serve giving them education to make better decisions be more self-determined empowered to do things differently for themselves and and that's what i had to demonstrate in my organization for years until the county finally got it the state finally got it you know and and now now legislation is changing and shifting and saying Oh, these peer things are pretty cool. You know, let's do, let's start to do more of that. And, and that's what it took. It took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears uh, put into it to, to demonstrate it because you, I couldn't just offer a concept and say, come on, everyone, let's go. And I look behind me, nobody's there. So it, it was really, uh, you know, a lot of work that went into it in, in demonstrating the, the value. I have a question for people who use peers because this is a really valuable conversation to me. The, the concern that always gets brought up is how do we ethically use peers to where we're not re-traumatizing them and we're protecting them in this role? So could those of you who use peers speak to that? Yeah, we're, we're nothing but peers. Um, so I can speak a lot to it because that is important. When I first, again, opened and got into crisis services, one thing I did recognize before it happened is that people are maybe, you know, affected by hearing someone else's story that was similar to theirs and then traumatizing them or re-traumatizing them. I built a wellness plan into the staffing and the training that we created to say that when you're feeling this, you have a 24 access to one of us, you know, a supervisor or whoever, and we're going to be there and we're going to support you in this. We're going to pull you out if we need to, we're going to retrain if we need to, or we're going to move you into a different department that's not as related. But I, but I don't want to get confused with performance-based employment either, because when you do hire the people that you hire in the services that you provide, you need performance from them. They need to be able to do the job. And that goes back to the qualifications and the characteristics of who you hire. 
uh, I found out very early, you know, it wasn't a good idea to just hire someone that said, I have lived experience because they may not have any work norms. They may not have any social norms. They might not have, you know, they just don't, don't have certain things that they need, qualities that they need. And, and so it goes back to that as well. So you're trying to pick and choose the best people for the best positions. Um, and, and that's what we've had to do over the years, which now we've got a great formula and we're very successful in, in doing it, you know, pretty well. Thank you might uh, try it, Courtney. Oh yeah. Courtney, you think it does that give you a good answer? It does. And I, Felicia, if you have more, I'd love to hear it as well. Thank you for well, we're uh we're still new to the pair the peer integration and we have to learn from our mistakes, to be honest, Courtney. Um and I was just in Spokane and they had a um a session on uh, peers um doing our CoreCon conference and it changed my entire world. I came back and restructured uh, my, the, the way that we all treat um, our peers and what we're doing. And the one thing that I um, that we have missing, um, if I can share, of Stephen, is that we did not have a peer supervising peers. Um, and not saying that it made a difference, but I believe it does make a difference because a peer understand the other peer. And I had to go back and apologize to one of the best peers that we actually had because we were wrong. Um, they left our company because we were wrong. And I was humble enough to go back and ask them to come back and lead our peers. Um, and that was so important because the it, it was the three S's. It was the support, it was the structure, and it was the safety. And those are the three most important things that you can give a peer in any organization. And I did not understand that. And so what we... I have learned personally over the last month is that it's so important that we have someone on our team, on our leadership team, that is a peer and that can assist us in integrating the peers and actually understanding the language and the life of um, those we love experiencing experiences without treating them different. And so that's my two cents that I want to um, incorporate because you have to you have to learn and when you when you learn you take a hold of it and I cannot wait to connect with you Stephen um offline because uh, I believe you can help us take it a little bit further as well thank you both so much and I love to hear that because that's something we've been actively exploring but wanting to make sure we're not exploiting someone's experience at the same time so I love your feedback and um, just kind of what you guys are doing that's kind of the highlight of the day right there Jason Jackson, let's talk a little bit about Louisiana. You, this is a completely different model where you're using the, the state as the driver of the service system. Is that right? How is that so different than the cities or so counties they're, driving um, the creative process? Yeah, I, I can say a little more about this. There is a state level strategy to roll out more robust crisis services um, just across the state and spanning someone to call, someone to respond and the place to go. We primarily work in New Orleans and they've stood up a mobile crisis intervention unit just for the, the city of New Orleans um, that is exclusively answering 911 calls as an alternative to police. Um, so I think these things are happening parallel to one another. Um, and I don't think Louisiana is necessarily alone in having um, that statewide approach, but um, I, I think the feeling is that kind of at every level, like or locally and at the state level, um, there just needs to be like more effort in this space. And uh, the challenge, I think, is making sure um, that these efforts are coordinated and, and filling whatever gaps might remain. So if if the state is doing one thing, um, but not another, and there's still that gap, like what can um, what can New Orleans do to to fill that gap? Or maybe like what what is an investment that can happen at the federal level to uh, to, to bolster um, all of these efforts? So that's just to say it, it's it's like a layered approach. I, I think it's like people at all levels just trying to to make this work for yeah. the state. I sort of visualize it as like the city, in this case, New Orleans is sort of doing their city level, like, Trying to build up and then the state is trying to like you know spread out and, and sprinkle things across but like a, an example not from new orleans and louisiana just the need to coordinate is like um another place where 
they are um, building out a civilian crisis response program or, or just trying to strengthen the crisis response at a city level. And then, um, you know, I don't know if this is a state or county specific thing, but in that jurisdiction, it's uh, the, the crisis receiving or the diversion center is operated at county level, right? And those things, funding's coming online in different ways, implementation, um, and, you know, the hope is that everything gets there and all these pieces come into place. But I think the reality is that um, with different, you know, government levels coordinating and different funding sources, these things are not always coming together in like a completely comprehensive way. So, yeah, I'm very keen to know about that. Um, the challenges there in the communication between the state and the local level, there's so much creative vigor in the run up to these teams or so many people who have great ideas. How do you organize and orchestrate that all going in the same direction? The interests of the state and the interests of the city might be quite different. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really tough one. I, I think like an area for coordination uh, that, that has come up and that we've talked about earlier in this conversation is, um, getting that like enhanced Medicaid support through ARPA funding. And I think there are opportunities for, for local stakeholders to identify that and maybe reach out to their state Medicaid office and say like, hey, like, what are you doing to at least look into this and see if there's a way that we can benefit from some of this funding. So um, I think, with 988 implementation too, it comes up. Um, there are questions about like with what uh, mobile teams are available to take on 988 calls when you know it seems like some kind of in-person response is needed. And I've heard sometimes that it's the team that was actually designed primarily to respond to 911 calls as an alternative that just mm -hmm. happens to already be operating. So they're playing that role. Um, or it might be, um, a more like um, traditional like mobile crisis team that isn't necessarily synced with 911, but operating in the crisis system already and connected to that that crisis line. So I think a lot of that planning has happened at the state level, and that coordination with local stakeholders across the state will be um, really important moving forward, and like always a challenge. Were there legacy teams already in existence in New Orleans before this uh, project got started? Um, yeah, there was, and, and they are still operating, but um, this new team was designed to exclusively handle 911 calls, probably because of what advocates were asking for, understanding just that, like, that continues to be the number people know to call. And there were a lot of missed opportunities because police or sometimes EMS, you know, they were always sent to those calls by default. So there is that legacy team that's that's still working out in the field and sometimes coordinating with the new program, which which just launched a month ago. So, you know, it's like a very live issue. And I, I think we're still learning a lot about how that program is working. But um, uh, but yeah, like this this new team answering 911 calls came about because of the recognition that there were there were more people that could be reached um, if you focused on um, that group that was coming to the attention of 911 specifically. And New Orleans had a consent decree or has a consent decree. Is this uh, team part of that as, at this point? Do you know? Um, so th this is like a health department led effort. Um, they've okay. contracted with a provider. So, um, I know the program coordinates with the police department, but I wouldn't say it directly falls under the consent decree. Is some of the passion here to, to start a team in New Orleans, is this stemming from 2020 and the murder of George Floyd and the sudden realization that we all had that we could do something different? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think locally, like there, there were so many incidents just in New Orleans that community members could point to where responses could have been improved um, in these cases where people in crisis were met by police. So um, I, you know, definitely it was happening at the same time that so many other communities were having these conversations. Um, and a lot of the 
a lot of the messaging I think was similar. Like, look, we're we're seeing this increasing number of programs that are intentionally reducing police involvement. Um, we don't need to like reinvent the wheel here. Um, we actually have a lot of like promising programs we can look to for inspiration. So, um, so yes, and um, I think there was just there was so much happening locally that um, you know inspired advocates to to get out there and push push for this kind of response. Yeah, and I'll just shout out um, the A Local Advocacy Group, um, our coalition in in New Orleans that. Um, and I, I am I don't know the, the details on the on the timeline exactly, Jason, to answer your question, but I, I think it's just to say that it's been a number of years of advocacy to um, you know get city council, get the city government, and now the health department um, organized and funded for this new program. So um, a lot of the advocacy in Orleans was led by the Orleans Parish Prison Reform Coalition, which mm -hmm. works on a range of issues, but um, for some time crisis response and better, better, you know, supports for people experiencing mental health and behavioral health crisis was a, was a big part of their, um, one of their big campaigns is uh, called, I think, Help Not Handcuffs. Um, so I think we've seen, you know, versions of this in many other places where um, community advocacy is really important to, um, you know, laying the groundwork, groundwork to get program implemented. And then obviously we know that the work continues from program implementation onwards to make sure that the program can scale and can you know really meet the the needs and hopes of of folks um, who are asking for these new programs. So. That's great to hear. That's great to hear that the attention is coming in New Orleans, which really needs it. And that you guys are watching it closely to see how it turns out. Any other questions from any other members of the panel or comments about today's sessions? Well, thank you so much for participating. This was fun. We had a high point with uh, learning about how peers could be incorporated into uh, mobile crisis teams. That was great. Thanks for participating with today with your sessions and with your leadership in your own communities. And thank you for having us. Thank you. Take care. Bye.